Welcome, Wargamers, to a new chapter in my coverage of Age of Sigmar lore. You see, I've done faction breakdowns for every single army in this game. I have a nice organized playlist for you, you can check them out. But I wanted to revisit them each in a very fresh way, through their eyes, and learn their stories. Because everything that I've done till this point has been from the perspective of me as an omniscient narrator. But I wanted to ask, what is the history of the Mortal Realms and its future look like from a particular faction, or a particular point of view? I won't waste any more time, but please tell me your feedback on this format. I need to know if this is something you like going forward, because it is a lot more work when it comes to making notes and stuff like that. But today we are talking about the titular character of the entire setting, Sigmar Heldenhammer himself. Picking up his story after awakening in the old world and bringing it to the current era of the beast. Before we jump into that story, I just want to give a shout out to Not Just Gaming, an awesome store on the east coast of the United States. They have discounts on all Games Workshop products as well as a ton of hobby supplies. So if there's anything you're looking for for your next project, if you use the affiliate link in my description below, it throws a little tip in my tip jar and it means the absolute world to me. This is a wonderful store to support and it goes directly to taking care of me, my wife, our cats, and I am so grateful to all of you. Our story begins in darkness, within the void of space itself. You see, the old world was lost, and clinging to a shard of its core was Sigmar Heldon, mantle of heavens, keeper of the wind of Azir, the magic itself bound to him in the final hours of the old world. But he was out cold. This guy was having a very, very bad time, and some point in his journey, he caught the attention of a traveling beast. You see, in the heavens, the stars, the void, there are certain animals that are of enormous magnitude. We call them god beasts, and one such god beast was named Dracoth, a celestial dragon of the heavens. And Dracothian found Sigmar, and he brought him to the mortal realms. They essentially uh, kind of gained a kindred spirit, both of them having kind of power based in Azir magic meant that they kind of trusted each other. They built this incredible friendship over a many, many centuries. Dracothian introduced Sigmar to the mortal realms, right? And this, this really is what begins the age of myth. And it's a very crucial time for a lot of the foundational lore regarding the rest of the story of AOS. Because it doesn't just affect the fates of mortals for generations, but it also reveals the character of Sigmar and many other gods, and we're going to get to their stories in relating to their factions. So he's just dropped off into this incredible setting, right? He, he does have deity level powers, he can go between the realms kind of as he chooses, but they're massive. I mean, Sigmar is not omnipotent, he doesn't know everything, he has to explore them inch by inch. And so what is an eternal supreme being of might and magic and will, what do they do? Well, they start over. As Sigmar was exploring the mortal realms, uh, he started to find trace amounts, I guess, I guess you could say tribes, of humans and elves and dwarves all over the place. But they were like caveman level technology, huddled around you know, small campfires, being attacked by things in the woods. They weren't able to handle the exotic creatures around them. They needed help. Now within this spread of, of creatures, I guess you could say, of the races of mortals, uh, humans are still the most prevalent, by far the most populous. The dwarves, there were a few of them, of course. Uh, some were mining the hills of the realm of metal. And the elves were very rare, like hyper rare. They didn't exist in the game for the first two years of its existence, pretty much in any way, shape, or form. But that's a whole side quest relating to the elven factions, we'll get to that later. So Sigmar's here and he wants to restart civilization, okay? To his knowledge, he's the only survivor. He's the only person that Dracothian personally brought over, so he doesn't understand that, like, that there are even threats on his level out there and abroad. But before society could exist, Sigmar needed the raw materials, okay? And when I say raw materials of a society, I mean he needed bodies. He needed industry. And so as he is kind of helping mankind establish itself, he goes off and explores the realms and he comes back with uh, more people. He starts bringing these isolated tribes of humans together. He teaches them rudimentary agriculture and the, how to make basic tools. And from this, you know, small tribal society, what we would call a civilization as a whole, meaning many groups of people coming together for a common state, that begins to exist within the mortal realms in a way it didn't before. But here's the thing, that's a long process, right? No matter how many tribes you bring together, the human population still needs to grow naturally. And so what essentially happened is Sigmar would dip out on 
his people that he was bringing to go off on adventures and explore the mortal realms, collect resources. If he finds more tribes, he can bring them in. But he essentially kind of checks out every once in a while, comes back, pushes them further technologically and governmentally, and then he'll dip back out again. And so this is how we have stories of him being like the firm developer of society within the early mortal realms, but also he's kind of everywhere exploring. He's just doing that for many, many years. And so we'll keep, you know, humanity and some other, you know, trace amounts of races developing in the background, what are these excursions that Sigmar goes on? Because a great many consequential things come out of this time. I'm not, I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, but these are the ones that I think uh, reflect Sigmar and his character enough to warrant being in his point of view video. In Chaman, the realm of metal, Sigmar finds a land absolutely jam-packed with minerals and wealth. This is all important for growing any society. If he wants to develop blacksmithing, they need iron, that kind of stuff. But while exploring the realm, he also finds two old familiar faces, Grimnir and Grugni, the dwarven gods bound and chained. They were actually chained at the top of a mountain and there's not really any word about how they got there. They are very secretive about how they ended up in that particular position. But Sigmar is looking around. He's like, what could bind two gods? Like, you know, in a way that effectively cuts them off from the rest of the realms. He had no idea. And this is one of those plot threads that's kind of thrown out there that I believe will be developed further down. So it seems odd, but we're again, we're in Sigmar's perspective. So he's like, I know these guys. I, I trust them, at least on a, a basic level. I mean, the dwarves had some honor in the old world. We could work together and parlay if we needed to. And so they were trustworthy enough in the old world to consider freeing them. Besides, Sigmar had been finding dwarves and on extremely rare occasion, elves in his travel, and so they would want to connect. He wanted to bring these two characters to their people. And in doing so, by freeing them, Sigmar gained two insanely powerful allies, the power of Akshi and Chaman, fire and metal on his side. In particular, his bond with Grugni will become very important in the future. But Sigmar's, you know, uh, Escapades continue. In Shayish, Sigmar found the realm of death to be a truly unruly place, I think is probably a good way to say it. Uh, because in Shayish at the time, before anyone was really ruling it, there was like minor death gods, like demigods, memories of forgotten afterlife deities from a thousand religions stalked wild. So normally you're supposed to go to like your civilization's particular underworld, but let's say that we believed in Satan, okay? I would die, go to Satan, Satan would torture me, he's made real by our belief, Shayish makes it. But what happens if the Satan from my religious belief breaks out and goes and starts punching, I don't know, any nefarious deity from any other religion? Let's say Loki, all right? Because if the I exist and my religion exists, so does mythologies from all different kinds of cultures. And so what if Satan and Loki start getting into a, a beer brawl? And then Vishnu comes out of the side with a chair. Like all these things can happen. And so these demigods are just rolling all over Shayish. But... It's a fight that Sigmar doesn't want to have. Like, nobody wants to be here. And so he's kind of like walking around Shayesh, noticing all of these like powerful players, but he's avoiding them because he doesn't know them. He doesn't want to disturb stuff. He doesn't understand kind of the ecosystem. And it was on this journey that he met another old acquaintance, Nagash, the Supreme Lord of Undeath, trapped in a deep pit, kind of like a chasm of some kind. He's just pinned down. Now, this is an important moment for our hero, Sigmar. On one hand, Nagash and Sigmar went toe-to-toe -to -toe in the old world, okay? Like, they are not friends. I think there's a whole book about Sigmar crushing Nagash, and, and Nagash keeps coming back and back and back. Sigmar and him have been at odds before. So it is a potential enemy that is here buried in the dirt. Then again, from another perspective, if I don't help him and he still gets out, he will definitely be an enemy. And even then... The foe that I know is preferable to the one that I don't, which is kind of an odd situation to be put in. You know, you would think millennia have passed. We both, you know, uh, theoretically went through the void and somehow ended up here. Surely we would have changed and grown as people. And, uh, you know, he extends that kindness of thought over to Nagash, who may or may not be worthy of it. But it's a still an interesting moment because it sets off a, a ch whole chain of events that we'll get to later on why he freed Nagash. Now, it could have also been that he's looking around Nagash, uh, Nagash's realm of Shayish, and he's seeing all these wandering demigods that make it an insanely hostile place and knows that if nothing else, freeing Nagash would at least keep him busy cleaning this place up, right? That's what he would want to do. And again, 
freeing him, forming an alliance, and having him spend millennia cleaning this place up is preferable to him getting out by accident and wanting to kill everybody. It's a bit of a tricky situation. I would like to know, what do you think? Was it a mistake? Was it the right thing to do? From that perspective, I feel like... <sighs> I don't know, man. I feel like the way things went in the future, they could have just built a better chasm to keep him locked away. I don't know. We'll see. Some other important and notable things that go on. Uh, over time, Sigmar is able to meet the elven gods, the twins of Hish, Teclas, and Tyrion, the mantles of uh, Shadows, Malarian, formerly named Malekith, and his mother, Marathi, uh, who was real vague on her ability to survive the old world because she was not a deity character. He met Alariel the Everqueen of Giran, who showed herself to be a joyous caretaker of the realm of life. And her tree children, known as the Sylvaneth, went far and wide to make sure nature thrived in every realm for the betterment of all. What we're seeing here is that every time he finds an ally, a new great thing unlocks. We'll get to the, what the elves brought here, but for example, like Alario, like deciding life will thrive in every single realm and then sending them out there, like that's awesome. In Gur, Sigmar matched his strength against Gorka Morka, the god of destruction, in a series of absurd contests, like drinking a lake, leveling a mountain, wrestling, and he gained the respect of that deity enough to direct it a bit. I'm not gonna say that he like commanded Gorka Morka, but it was enough that Sigmar could find dangerous monsters or just kind of threats in general around the realms and point Gorka Morka at it, which is, very valuable. And so all of these characters came together to form a very loose pantheon of gods from all the winds of magic. But as characters were introduced, plots thicken and they twist. But again, we're following Sigmar, one perspective. And the Heldenhammer becomes sort of an ad hoc hero and leader of this pantheon. Now, he's not directly challenged. It's not like he's, you know, named king and they all have to bow before him. It's it's a loose agreement, but it just kind of feels like everyone in this group is like either not, if they're not indebted to Sigmar directly, they at least respect him enough to hear him out on his opinion, which is probably true of all the elves, right? They all respect him enough to hear him, but the other characters that he rescued or, you know, freed in some capacity, all of them like they're a little bit indebted to him for sure and while this is going on gifts are exchanged as a sign of good faith in this new era and and this is the moment in the age of myths where i think the potential was truly limitless right because um god's gift to the other deities seemed to be less focused on material stuff like rather than artifacts his big contribution was roaming around and finding mortals these deities that were locked away desperately wanted to find their kin. So to the dwarves, he now, you know, they're now called Dwarden, he introduced the dwarven gods. There was a few elves that he introduced to Teclas and Tyrion, but they largely stayed in the cities of Sigmar because uh, they, they didn't want to displace him too much. But he also created standing armies to defend mortals. So Sigmar was sort of like the warrior king that they needed, right? In this hostile environment where we're still trying to establish stuff, you have to make a secure perimeter. Sigmar's providing that for all of these deities in some way or another. So those were kind of Sigmar, what he brought to the Pantheon at its table, right? He uh, freed a lot of them, united them, and then is actively defending. But the gifts he was given in return for this were very interesting. And sometimes you get a really good glimpse into someone's character when you watch the way that they receive or what they do with a gift, how they evaluate what it does, what it's worth, assess sentimental value and respond appropriately. You can learn a lot about someone. Think about that at your next birthday party. And so let's go through a few of these. You will see exactly what I'm. So there's a few big ones here that are highly related to other books, series and stuff like that. First of all, there are the gifts of Grug. Grugni was, as I mentioned before, a very powerful ally to have. Grugni brought to civilization a technological prowess that could not be outdone. Think of it as like getting him on your team is like a, unlocking the industrial revolution in the Civ game or something like that. The man knows machines and teaches everyone how to build them. So now the whole civilization gets like a technological level up. Not only that, but being from Chamon, he's able to create large long, long lasting connections to that realm. And now minerals and resources are flowing into just the living mortals of the realms in never before seen numbers. It's really cool. Malarian, formerly Malekith, the, the god of shadows, gifts Sigmar with a fighting arena of all things. Basically, it's like a training arena where if you get the crud kicked out of you inside of it, you don't die, you leave having taken no wounds. So it's for both entertainment, but also of course training. And it was Teclas who gave one of the more interesting gifts known as the Enlightenment Engine, which essentially is a giant machine and you put it one in each city and you turn it on, everything in its radius, essentially the 
city's borders, gets the, the gifts of Hish, meaning they become more intelligent, enlightened, wise, reasonable, and everything just kind of functions better. So when you combine machines and technology and people having a renaissance of how to use those machines and technology, along with the numbers and the culture that Sigmar is driving in, you can see why all of this is just turning up. You know, it's all thumbs up. Everything's good. We're banging on all cylinders. And this is where like things really prospered for mortals of the realms. And this is where we got those big wondrous heights that we talk about when we usually mention the age of myth. Flying machines and arcane machinery that like can harness the power of Hish into a drill bit or something just absurd stuff that is like esoteric and practical mixed together but on a scale that is utterly impossible to us in the real world and while everything seems awesome we also have to remember that all of these deities have their own goals and motivations and even not goals and motivations also flaws is a big one so pride arrogance secrecy and doubt infect and tear this pantheon apart more than anything okay it really destroyed them but the most important thing that all of this kind of going off in different directions and not having cohesion did was it distracted them so what are the ways in which people are getting distracted and or showing their flaws well let's talk about sigmars right this is his video we'll start there the biggest one and the most obvious glaring thing was what he did with the gift from teclas the enlightenment engines again they were made so that uh, it was his teclas's gift to mankind to be like everyone can now be enlightened as long as you're near these things to help speed up progress and things like that well sigmar looked at those and was like i have a, a better idea he takes them and and he goes over and has this huge vault of all the weapons and all the weird stuff he's collected in all these travels that I mentioned. Again, he's been doing this for millennia. And he gets the idea of what if I what if I reversed this? Like reversed what the actual enlightenment engine does. Rather than making people full of enlightenment, smarter, remember things better, what if we flipped it to where it made them dimmer? They forgot things quite a bit easier. And so he reverse engineered the Enlightenment engines to be what are called penumbral engines, which allow uh, secrecy, essentially. And this is, again, where we get to see a lot of Sigmar's character. Because he has this mass of weapons that he apparently hasn't told to the other deities, which is, you know, he's hoarding something, which is very strange. And he gets the idea of like, well, I don't want to have all these powerful artifacts and, and whatever in one place, because if anyone raids that place, then we're all hosed. So what if I, on my travels, then just build a bunch of vaults and hide them away? And so he starts building these things and basically having like storage houses for all these amazingly, immensely powerful items that he's found all across the realms. Each one of them with a pen number engine to keep them secret to the point where other deities can't even see these things. Now, there's a lot of things wrong with this. One, you're spreading weapons everywhere. You're hoarding weapons that others don't know about. And also here's the question, why do you get to decide what happens with this stuff who are you to decide this should not be in the hands of x it needs to be hidden from them you know and and when i say x i mean like mortals deities all of that it's an act of of mistrust and the fact that he took a good thing the enlightenment engine and twisted the magics to do the exact opposite of the gift will send teclas into a fury later on but i think that's sigmar's big flaw at this point is like you've just decided to start taking all these things you're manipulating the gifts that you're getting why Unless you think that you're in complete control and you could just do whatever you want, why are you doing this? Now, at the same time that that's happening, it could be that he's doing it as a result of everyone else acting real dodgy. As I mentioned, this point in time when things are at their best is where the gods get really distracted. So meanwhile, the elves are being super dodgy, like something's up with all of them. But Sigmar doesn't really know what it is, right? There's some questions about how Marathi got here don't know we'll put a pin in that and circle back but her malarian teclas and Tyrion are all acting we real strange and if he asks a Al lariel from kiran what are those other four up to she disavows all knowledge so it's just like y'all are being real mysterious maybe it was that uh distrust that saw him switch the enlightenment engines over to the penumbral ones i don't actually know there's no timeline for these things but as far as we can tell they're all happening concurrently because they take so long so the elves are all being strange um gribnir from the the dwarves that he freed is getting really antsy he likes to fight and there hasn't been a good one lately and so 
uh, he's basically pestering Grig, uh, Sigmar a lot of like, give me a challenge, right? You freed me from our prison at the top of the mountain. I owe you a life debt. Let me pay it off. Point me at something really big. So Sigmar goes, okay, I could do that. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest things I found when I was out traveling was this giant monster known as Volcatrix, the mother of salamanders. Uh, go, go fight that. And this, if you know the story of the Fire Slayers, gets Grimnir shattered into a billion pieces spread across the realms for centuries. So like that doesn't look good for Sigmar as a leader. <laughs> Go here. And then just immediately the dude gets punked. Okay. So now the Pantheon has lost one of its members for no reason. And then four of them are kind of keeping to themselves in the elves. Moving on, we have Grugni, uh, the, the, smithing deity from Chaman and Alariel, the ever queen are both very emotionally disconnected. Okay. Like when I say disconnected, uh, Grugni would like to spend eternities in his workshop and is very quick to forget his children. He's like, ah, uh, uh, you know, I brought them up to a good place. They're on their own. They need to stand on their own two feet. He basically just abandons all of the dwarves to hang out in his, you know, personal realm at his little deity level smithing shop. Alariel is just very intent on Giran. That's just all she cares about is Giran. Like she sent emissaries out to other realms, but she's really focusing on building up the realm and making it the most verdant place. She just doesn't really care about things going on around her. On top of that, Gorkamorka and Nagash keep getting harder and harder to manage. Gorkamorka, because doesn't like the idea of being a dog who's just sent to go pick fights with things, like doesn't like taking orders. And Nagash very much thinks that he should always be in charge. Why are we listening to Sigmar? At what point is that debt paid kind of questions? And the whole time he is in Shayish gobbling up all these uh, minor death deities. So he's like solidifying his own power base. So as you can see, our Pantheon, it got together, it focused really well, and then it got distracted. And, and all of this squabbling and these distractions made it easy for things to go unnoticed. Whispers, magic, rituals, that the Pantheon would have been keenly looking for at any other time, but they missed it. And with them distracted, the dark powers of chaos that seemed to be a long forgotten nightmare in this utopia crawled into the mortal realms and it was lit on fire all over again. Regardless of what you think of, of Sigmar himself or the deity character from whatever factions you play, I think it's important to state here that every good god, okay, and I'm including Nagash and Gorkamorka because at this point it's one pantheon, all of them failed the mortals of these realms by not paying attention and keeping a vigilant eye for chaos. The great arcane techno states that were born through centuries of enlightenment and plenty were torn down. Oftentimes, this was a result of forgotten tribal cultures falling to chaos, forming great war bands, and then roving across the continent. That story plays out a lot. It's probably the most prevalent in Akshi, but that same situation of these small tribal cultures falling to chaos individually, and then that event snowballing to incredible heights is the story of chaos infecting the realms. And to this, the various deities here had mixed reactions. Some of them, like Alariel, focused exclusively on her own realm, right? Nurgle came into Garan with a thunder, and so she could not care less about anything else. She was effectively taken out of the, of the greater battle by her own I guess, focusing on her realm. Some, like Teclis, Tyrion, and Grugni, so the two elven gods and one of the dwarven ones, they were all just off doing their own things, not paying attention to the destruction of their people. They were like, Teclis was out reading a book with his moon cat that he likes to hang out with, studying magic. Grugni is in his mind thinking, my people have to learn to work for themselves if they want to survive. But it was Sigmar, held in hammer for the most part, who tried to be the warrior god that the Pantheon needed, right? That's kind of his whole role. That's what he offered when he united them. How are we gonna do this? And so his efforts, mostly during the late age of myth, early age of chaos, it's kind of a, a nebulous period, were directed at carving out some military victory, securing the realms, and then we're gonna go place by place and purge chaos. So that's what he's looking to bring, but the problem is, the wildfire had just spread way too far. There was too much disunity amongst the Pantheon to get ahead of threats before they erupted into something big. And there were too many enemies coming from too many different directions. Because, you know, I mentioned at the top that Nurgle went into Guran, so did Korn and Zinch and Chaos Undivided and Slanesh. All of them went everywhere. It was a 
free for all. And so at a certain point, Sigmar is realizing this just isn't working because what Sigmar wanted at that point was a single big win. Yeah, we're gonna get all these militaries together, have a decisive military crush, and then we'll just, you know, as they're running away, this is when we'll reverse the tide and purge chaos from the realms. Well, he got his shot at a singular uh, decisive military victory at the Battle of the Burning Sky. And however the, the punch and counter punch between this original pantheon and the chaos gods went down, it ended up in like a massive battle, like to the point where it's like armies going horizon to horizon, just charging at each other. Now, the Battle of the Burning Skies is important because it was uh, the defining battle of the Age of Myth and also the nail in its coffin, right? It was supposed to be the linchpin turn where the, the gods and mortals would walk you know, among their people and push back chaos. But things went wrong immediately for Sigmar. First of all, Nagash did not show up. One of the entire gods of the pantheon was just like nah the one with the most disposable troops right the undead army was like nah i don't care sigmar took this as a personal betrayal okay um but get this he still tried to fight the battle and it went as expect they lost the forces of order were absolutely uh, shattered and what resulted was a crushing defeat during the fight itself uh, sigmar went to duel archaeon the ever chosen another nightmare from the past come to life. And at one point, Sigmar throws his hammer Galmaraz at the villain only for Archeon to shatter like glass because it was actually an illusion by Zinch. It separates the god of lightning from his weapon. And this essentially was like losing a part of him, right? Part of his essence was in that hammer. And in that moment, it was lost to everybody. And it's at this point that Sigmar realizes this whole premise was wrong, right? This was never going to work. Chaos was never going to be turned back in a single battle. We need something else. And so being thoroughly defeated, Sigmar sounded the retreat, but it, it wasn't a retreat like anyone else because in that moment of realizing this will not work to stop chaos, a new idea formed. When he sounded that retreat, he wasn't going home. He was going home to lock the doors. The storm god, you see, had meticulously mapped every realm gate leading to Azir. And the order was given when he returned to seal them. And so for this, a call went out, right? Um, mortals of every race from all across the realms were told the gates of Azir are closing. You need to be on this side of them if you want to come with us and hide. And so all of a sudden, races from every single faction are pouring into their nearest gate to Azir. But while that quest was happening, because I assume it would take some time for people to travel, Sigmar had one last quest amongst the mortal realms. So everyone's fleeing one direction, he's walking out of the gate to go finish a mission. Now, remember at this point in the story that these deities are very fallible, right? And we get a front row seat to Sigmar's sin. While the gates are closing, he goes to Shayish because he wants a vengeance on Nagash. And he goes on a military crusade, which is about one very specific thing, revenge. And frankly, this was a bad idea. He just wanted revenge for Nagash not showing up to the Battle of the Burning Skies, which is like, it's already over, it's done, but he just can't let it go. And this was a terrible idea. So while Chaos is marching everywhere, Sigmar marches on Shayish. And the realm is still on fire around him. Like there's armies roving all over the place, uh, undead warbands trying to fight off chaos ones. And he's essentially walking straight up to Nagash's main chamber. He's trying to like go right to Nagash's are. Along the way, a few things happen that are very important. The first one is he comes against a an interesting looking fortification, which he later finds out is a prison. Thinking it's something else, he smashes it apart. No two stones like no on top of each other. And you know, it's just to get his stress out. But what he doesn't understand is that that prison is essentially like its destruction is the founding of the flesh eater courts this is a prison where um one of the original vampires was held and went absolutely mad and now that madness affects everybody so think about this sigmar is the reason that an entire faction of death army exists that is actively turning people into cannibalistic monsters when i say this is a consequential move I mean it. So we got that, right? So Nagash catches wind uh, that Sigmar's army is coming for him, and he responds by sending his champion, a general named Catacros, to go stop Sigmar. As you can imagine, this ends poorly 
for old Catacros. He basically got windmill slammed into oblivion, but because his soul was chosen by Nagash and kind of augmented, much in the same way that a Stormcast is, I, I guess you could say, he wasn't destroyed. And so Sigmar kind of like tossed it back and was like, throw it in a storm vault. You know, he's got those all over the place. Glad I have them now. And he thinks nothing of them. Again, if you, you know who that character is, that is like the dude of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, who was then unearthed much later on in the Age of Sigmar to come back and haunt Sigmar himself. But back to the Age of Myth. At this point, um, we're still in decline. Right, and Sigmar had a choice to make. He just smashed Nagash's army and his emissary. Do I continue hunting Nagash at the risk of leaving the gates to Azir opened or, or setting off more chaos that's unintentional? Or do I fall back and see to my own people? And you know, taking Nagash's champion in such a dire moment it would have been payback enough. Essentially saying that like Nagash is going to fall because he can't take chaos on all by himself and I just took out one of his best fighters. He's not looking good. So... Again, stuffing that raw soul of Catacros into a storm vault, Sigmar returned to Azir and closed the gates. An event that was the birth of many Chaos armies who felt abandoned by their gods. There's actually a great story in the Slaves to Darkness book about um, a whole kingdom. Like he got a king, got all of his people together, mobilized them. He's like, we're going to the nearest gate of Azir. They're being chased down by a corn army at the gate and in the moment they arrive at it it slams shut and they are abandoned their rage at the gods for abandoning them leads them to become a chaos warp again more uh, echoes of, of consequences for actions it's that's all he's doing is setting off a lot of ro stones that are rolling downhill so people are flocking in now the gates are sealed but that sadly was not the end and like i said um Things get real dark in this story, and this is, to me, the darkest part. Because now that the doors are sealed, well, it's good to isolate an infection, but now you have to burn it out. And so all of these people from various um, social statuses and races and heritages flock to Azir for safety, and what they walk into is the greatest purge known to the realm so far. Sigmar wipes out most of the human government, seeing it as corrupted by chaos and he essentially bleeds Azurheim, the, the capital in carnage i went into this a lot in my first cities of sigmar video how dark that period really was but essentially you have to purify the people you have to get chaos out and it starts with mortals who can bring chaos in so it has to be done it's for the greater good if you will and over time the dust does settle, the gates get reinforced, the lands heal, and Azir becomes a bastion of Sigmar that he was hoping for. But the cost was incredible. Like, and it's hard to put in perspective that the people don't take that for granted. They have entire um, monument structures and bells that toll that remind them of those who were lost. Like, it's built into their culture, but this is a significant moment for any survivors from the Age of Myth. You also have to remember that at this point, when the purges stop, they are still just a motley crew of mortals. They have the infrastructure of a civilization, but they are not an army. Like, they're not just, they can't just figure out how to go back out and, and, and take the realms back. Now, at this point, it's important to know that when Sigmar lost his hammer and sounded their retreat even when he went to go you know beat the snot out of uh, Nagash essentially the idea was we're going to go back to Azir lock the doors wait for this to blow over and we're going to take our time and develop a way to really fight chaos like in a, in a big ultimate way and so now that the doors were sealed Sigmar begins to form his plan we're going to go back to the mortal realms like but how now this next section is really covered well in the Stormcast Eternals and the Cities of Sigmar battle tomes um, but with this vision of reclaiming what was lost, a lot needed to be done. And so Sigmar saw fit to initiate two grand initiatives, for lack of a better word. Uh, the first one being the reconstitution of mortal armies, right? He had all these people, these survivors, but they needed again to be organized and formed into something with discipline and strength. But in this, all people would become one. This is why we have the idea of uh, the cities of Sigmar, including all different kinds of uh, factions and settlements and uh, races of Duarden and Elves. And the, what we would now call the cities of Sigmar are formed uh, based on going into an area and defending it 
inhabiting. You have to like organize which lands you were going to claim and all the various military formations and factions would convene together, make agreements, bond them together for life on how they were going to do this. So mass armaments, military formations, artillery, all these things, the dwarves bought the guns, the humans brought the numbers, the elves brought like the mastery over the environment, and all those things are going in. But it's more than just understanding the military strength that was at play in Azir. Again, they also needed numbers, and that's going to take a long time. These populations have to recover. So the forming of, again, what we would later know as the cities of Sigmar, these, these founding colony crews, pioneers, I guess re-pioneers because they already used to live there, start forming. And, and while that is going on, Sigmar is also doing his second initiative, which was something new. An ultimate weapon made with fighting chaos in mind. Something that would tip the odds back to the mortals of the realms. And so this was really the founding of the Stormcast Eternals. Sigmar went to Grugni, the smithing god for aid, and the process of this building an army began. So it was really Grugni who took what Sigmar was saying and turned it into a blueprint. We're going to map the power of Azir to a mortal soul, forge them in this, reforge them, and then oh, they can live eternal. And so this is really where the Age of Chaos kind of takes over the story, right? Because that's where the chapter ends. They're in Azir, ragged, with a rough plan. And our story picks up again nearly 500 years later. 500 years of planning, preparing, training, and building and when that's done the gates of azir reopen now in that time uh things had gotten a lot worse for the realms right believe it or not the problem didn't fix itself but regardless of that the the plan of reclamation begins essentially sigmar launches with three missions one secure a foothold in akshi two find a lariel which is in Girian, and three, make a connection to the Duarden over in Chamath. Now that's not a bad plan, right? Um, you're securing your main base in Akshi, and you have two very meaningful allies in Alariel and uh, the Duarden, right? Who are gonna bring the raw materials into your coffers that you need. Well, those opening novels that we got in AOS establish Akshi as the foothold, and soon Hammerhall would be the city that's that's founded there in its borders. Alariel is found and restored, Behemoth, the father of Gargants is struck down in the process. But in Chamon, something very unusual happens. Uh, Sigmar's host find a strange energy source that is Galmaraz. And a short and brutal campaign sees the hammer returned back to Sigmar. So now he's like whole again. Things are looking good. These actions were part of a larger campaign known as the Rumgate Wars. I did a full deep dive series on that. Please go check it out. But at the end of it, you know, Sigmar's chances are looking good. He's got allies, realm gates, territory, and now phase two begins expansion. This time period is known as the Seasons of War, where the great cities of the mortal realms are founded and raised. Again, now we have the cities of Sigmar, and these are the key holds that you can play in that book. And all of that is awesome, right? The ball is rolling. Old friendships are being restored and new ones made. So now there's new factions that didn't exist before. The Fire Slayers, who are religious fiery zealots desperately trying to put Gr uh, Grimnir back together. Not sure how much Sigmar told him about his part to play in all that. But then there's also the Carriage and Overlords who are Dwarden who really don't like their own deity Grugni for abandoning them. That's fair. They meet the Sylvaneth again on their journeys to uh, get Alario back into gear, which they do successfully. Like things are happening in the story. And in that 500 year window, the armies of Chaos had gotten divisive and disorganized. Even though they had taken up whole swaths of a continent, if you don't have an enemy to point your warband at, things fall apart very quickly for Chaos Army. And so all of that meant that this was a kind of momentum that Sigmar could seize. We're expanding, we're looking good, the forces of Chaos are in disarray, they don't know how to handle us, and we're shutting off realm gates that are important to them. It's good. But then a few troubling reports start to trickle in. Firstly, Stormcast Eternals didn't seem to be right after reforging. If they reforged too much, they started to get weird personality quirks. And then he started getting all these reports from his, his wizards and seers that something weird was happening in Shayish. Maybe the two were related, maybe not, I don't know. But this time of prosperity, uh, and, and also like dark omens at the same time goes on for a bit until the necroquake happens. At once, there is a standing undead horde outside of every city 
wall, and gate. Magic itself goes insane to the point where spells take on a crude sentience of their own and don't go away, i.e. endless spells. Uh, the Anvil of Apotheosis, used to forge the Stormcast Eternals, was nearly blown out of the sky, held together just by Sigmar, but it's like out of commission, and a wave of necromantic power washes across the realms. Again, there were hints that something was happening in Shyish, but it was so vague. Whatever Nagash was doing there, it was big. And not only did it wreak uh, havoc that we just mentioned, but it had a second thing. It revealed all of the dirty secrets of Sigmar. You see, this whole time, he's been building things up and getting new friends and like, yeah, things are good, things are good. And then when the Necroquake happens, the Storm Vaults are revealed. Whatever this power is, essentially decommissions all of the penumbral engines that Sigmar had taken and twisted from being Enlightenment engine. So his flaws are now on display for everybody. And not only that, across every single realm, powerful artifacts are revealed as things things are happening, right? Of course, all these penumbral engines are breaking down. And in a video about that, I described it as if, what if all across our globe now, caches of nuclear weapons just magically appear. Your bigger nations are going to have the capacity to seize most of them, right? We have troops that we can get in the plane, we can send them out there, but we are not going to be able to get all of them. We meaning whatever country you're a citizen of. No one can get all of them. So now you have the prospect of some very scary people, in AOS's case, orcs, for example, uh, random chaos war bands, having ungodly levels of power because of the weapons that they have found, they didn't earn. Sigmar just left them like little hidey spots, geocaches all over the realms, thinking he was being real smart. So, to kind of save face, Sigmar, of course, sends out thousands of crusades to go defend these sites. But, like I said, there's no way to get them all. And now this new pantheon, what I'm going to call the Pantheon of Order, right, because now we know it as Order, is rattled by Sigmar's deceit. Nobody is happy. Nobody wants to work together. This is a massive act of distrust. And while none of these things are good for Sigmar, like none of this screams, you know, you're doing great guy, it did turn the attention of every single Chaos army towards Shyish, which I guess is kind of a win in its own right, right? The Necroquake was so big that beating Sigmar became a side quest for the Chaos Gods. That's how big this thing was supposed to be. Everyone immediately was like, Nope, that's not the issue. We're all going to turn towards Shyish. This is going to be great. So it's a moment that's bad for Sigmar, you know, PR wise, but it also is a reprieve from direct focus. There's actually a great um, section in the Malign Portents book, I think it was, or maybe it was Malign Sorcery. One of those where basically they have a section for all four of the Chaos Gods being like, this is why I need to kill Nagash. Like, for Slanesh, it was like the world would become dead and it would become stagnant and boring. Like, that's why he wanted to kill him. But it's it's anathema to Slanesh, so it's like, we gotta deal with this. With the Anvil of Apotheosis needing repair, Sigmar released the Sacrosanct Chamber, his experts in ghost, demons, and magic, because they used to run the Anvil, but with that being broken, well, let's take these warrior experts of the mystic and actually use them in battle. But aside from that, to be honest, Sigmar himself did not make many like major moves during the time that we know as the Soul Wars. This is a time where the forces of order battened down the hatches and weathered the storm, in this case the Necro Storm, because anyone who was looking for a fight was going to Shyish. Of course, he was still doing things, fighting battles, growing cities, trying to make allies. It just, it wasn't a time where the forces of order were kind of the instigators of action. They were survivors of it. And it's at this point, while everyone's kind of, you know, huddled up trying to survive whatever Nagash is doing, that Marathi comes with a warning. Marathi has kind of been a, a side ally to the Pantheon for a while. I mean, she's, she's a part of it, the Pantheon of Order. Her daughters of Cain are awesome to have with marching with the cities of Sigmar. But Marathi comes to Sigmar and says, listen, Archeon, I found this out. He has a plan. He found a way to get into the gates of Azir. All he needs is this material called Varanite. I will send a detachment to stop them. If you could just send a few Stormcast to help me, that would be a wonderful. So Sigmar dispatches a contingent of Stormcast with Marathi uh, to kind of shut this all down when he's betrayed by Marathi. This was all um, covered in the Broken Realm series of campaign books. I went into a lot of detail. I did a full play-by-play -play if you want this. But essentially, she lures the Stormcast in, uses them as a scapegoat to take all the attacks from the Chaos things. Her daughters of Cain go in, steal the Varanite for herself, and ditches the Stormcast. Now, of course, this 
enraged Sigmar. He basically was duped, but the insult wasn't over. Using the Varanite, Marathi was able to ascend to godhood herself and claimed one of Sigmar's cities, Anvilgard, for her own calling it Harkura. To me, this was a way bigger slap in the face than Nagash ever did, but like, I also understand that the stakes are also a lot lower, right? Nagash not showing up to the Battle of the Burning Skies is more important than a singular city. But regardless, all of this might have truly risen to a great fight had the Era of the Beast not dawned. While Anvilgard was burning, Excelsis was crumbling, and Vindicarum was dang near dust. Like all of our major cities were getting attacked. Anvilgard uh, was being usurped by Marathi, of course, but Excelsis was being raided by forces of destruction, Vindicarum by chaos. And all of these, like I said, were part of the Broken Realms campaign. I cannot stress enough how awesome that story was. And people often ask how come he didn't pick a fight with Marathi over Anvilgard, but to be honest, I think he has bigger issues, right? Two other major cities are being dashed, and at least Marathi has a personal investment in keeping Anvilgard safe, right? He's probably thinking, I could deal with her later. I have pressing things. Meanwhile, over in Giran, Alariel did some kind of spell, which we know as the Rite of Life, that drastically changed the balance of power in the realms. Death magic was now receding, life magic was surging, harvests were bountiful, populations were booming. Again, after Nagash had kind of throttled things with the Necroquake, now again, we are kind of at a point of hope. And this really brings us to the current timeline and, and kind of where I'm gonna end this video. So Sigmar's limitations, his flaws, and his sins, for lack of a better word, have been on display. Now the Pantheon knows where everybody stands. We've all hidden things from each other. We've all lied. Sigmar has no official tie to leadership, but he can loosely work together with the other forces of order, which is why you may have two order armies fight each other, and it makes absolute sense. He's established cities, but he dang near lost two of them, and one of them was taken away by a... Uh, an ally at one point, Marathi, but now we have new threats on the horizon. Because now that the Necroquake isn't taking all the attention of Chaos Armies, they're gonna go back to the cities, like, or back to the forces of order, rather. Also, Nagash wasn't destroyed. Like, he's still a thing. He, he has armies. He's still a force, right? He's a whole grand alliance. And then we have other characters like Archeon the Everchosen, who has never stopped hunting Sigmar. To our knowledge, he's still trying to break into Azir. He was, plans were slowed down by Marathi, but she didn't do anything to stop them. And finally, Kragnos was also released uh, as a result of Alariel's spell. Unintentional consequence, but now there is a deity level character who has absolutely no ties, connection, or allegiance to Sigmar out here running amok. That being said, it is also a time of possibility again. Because as things are going well, uh, I highlighted that the ritual of life makes crops grow and, and people more fertile and so populations boom as well. These are all things that Sigmar knows and is using to his advantage. This is why we have what's called the Dawnbringer Crusades. Massive population spikes, they use the powers they get from Chaman and Guran to send out, you know, um, expeditions to go found new home. Just like when they had a few wins before and then they had the, um, the War for Life where they started to expand. Again, after the Necroquake has passed, they're expanding again, which is awesome because it makes the world so much more full. Sigmar's story is one of of learning lessons, right? And so let's let's start moving into a section that I end all my videos with talking about why is this cool? Because to me, Sigmar is about, it is, it's a story of losing everything twice and you get to see the worst parts of yourself while it happens, right? Um, Sigmar begins the setting as a warrior king but it gets him in trouble because he keeps trying to pick fights that he can't win. He's not fighting chaos correctly. First, it distracts him and chaos enters, and then it deludes him. You know, his his brashness and desire for a fight. In fact, that brashness is how he ends up losing Galmaraz. He tries throwing it like he's a Jedi with a lightsaber for some reason, and he just it just goes away. His temper saw him chasing after Nagash after the Battle of the Burning Skies when everything was already lost. Just stay in his ear and make everybody safe. Nope, he got mad and he went after Nagash, birthed the faction of Flesh Eater Courts, stomps Catacro. You know, I mean, he just, he does all these unintentional consequences because he gets ahead of himself and doesn't think. It's the saga of a hero who finds that he's, he's actually more powerful by putting his weapon down. But what I mean by that is when he retreated to his ear after the purge, he's making these plans I think that was a moment of character reflection for Sigmar, to look back on his life, what he's accomplished, and realized, I am not a warrior king. Like, I, 
I don't do as much on the front lines anymore. It's not where my actual strength is. Because if we look at the scale of what he accomplished in the Age of Myth and in Azir, it, it shows that if he tempers his anger, he's actually more formidable. He's built an entire new kind of army, the Stormcast Eternal. He brought in, saved, and purged, and you know, purified, for lack of a better word, millions. Millions. It's not enough, but it's a lot. And actually, that's why I've, uh, I've mentioned it in a, a recent video at the time of recording, but one of the key things I, I learned from watching designer interviews with the GW staff is they love the idea of the hammer because it's both a, a tool of destruction and creation, right? It's a weapon, so destruction, but it's also a tool. You can build things with a hammer. And so I think Sigmar has really exemplified that. Um, he started as a warrior god, but it just, it wasn't the tool that we needed. What we needed was a king who could like come up with bigger, longer lasting, more like with plans with longevity rather, and some foresight to guide us. We don't need someone to fight our battles for us. And I like this because Sigmar isn't meant to be perfect, but he is trying, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions and all the stories that are generated from his exploits are a testament to that. And there's so many consequences. You know, I mentioned like um, honest folk being locked outside of Azir, the purge that happened within it, now Stormcast are fraying their minds are becoming unstable all of it it was all the right choice to make but it was the hardest one with the most consequences and i feel like when he decided to put down the hammer and start making the hard choices is when sigmar's civilizations that he manages really start to thrive his secrets the storm vaults in this example uh, were undefendable, but his intent was good the whole time. And so that's kind of why I like him as a hero. He's complicated. He's fallible. He messes things up. He's messy. But at the end of the day, you see a character who is doing his best trying. And I like that. Anyway, friends, I know this has been a very long video. I don't normally do this. I would like to know your thoughts on the format. The other ones won't be as long because other factions haven't been relevant nearly as long as Sigmar has. Uh, but let me know your thoughts down below. If there were important bits of story from your particular faction that Sigmar has to do with, please leave in the comments down below. Uh, I always, I'll pin the most entertaining one. Uh, thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I can't wait to catch you in my next Age of Sigmar video. Happy Wargaming.